Shalom everyone, Today is the second class in Musa. We're going to continue. Hopefully we do at least one or two of the ten remembrances. Yes. Uh, we are number five, receiving the Torah on Mount Sinai. We almost finished Amalek. I thought we finished, but I have a question from Winnie in the future to be called Esther about Amalek of today. She was asking... Um, how you can identify Amalek today? They're, they're, this nation exists or not exist? Um, that's a good question. And the answer to that is as follows. There was a king many, many years ago who lives in the days of the first temple. It's around 70, 80 years before the story of Megillat Esther, the story of Esther. Okay? And his name was Sanherib. Sanherib, he believe in transfer, meaning mixing nations. He conquered the entire world and in order to give the people the feeling of insecure, so when they won't rebel against them, he transferred nations from place to place. So Edomite he sent to Africa and from Africa he brought people here and from India he mixed the entire world. And people, when they get there, they mix with the locals. Years later, there is no more evidence, and I'm talking generations later, no more evidence, no Amaliki, no Moavi. No. So we can't really today uh, know who is Moabite, for example, that you can accept them if someone will come to convert. And the Torah specifically says you cannot accept Ammonite and Moabite, the men, not the women. So... What if a Moabite comes to me and he wants to convert? And I don't know. So i transgressing a law of the Torah right on the spot. I'm committing a grave sin. How would I know if this guy is Moabite or how would I know if this guy is forbidden to be converted? So the Allah says that, kol parish meruba parish. Meaning, if someone comes from a world of uh, 8 billion people, the chances that will be from that forbidden nation is very small. And we hope that Hashem won't send these kind of people to us if He doesn't want, him, want us to convert them. That's it. What about Amalek? Because Amalek has a mission to destroy Israel. So the rabbis, our teachers, gave us a sign to recognize Amalek, and there is Amalek today. How you can recognize them? Amalek is someone that hates Jews. For no reason, he just wants to hate you, he doesn't know anything about Judaism, or he could know a lot about Judaism, but he hates you only for the reason you are Jewish. He didn't do anything to them. You know, the people, for example, in, in, in Germany, they never met a Jew. I don't have any, we don't share any borders with them, but you tell them a Jew, they will kill you or kill them. They, 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 they want uh, Jewish blood. It's in their DNA. Because Amalek did a really good job with his descendants, teaching them, instilling in, in his mind, in their mind, the hatred toward the Jewish people. So that, this is a sign. It's a sign. On a spiritual level, we know that any uh, non-believer, because the flag of the Amalekite is non believing in God, there is no God, everything is just happens to be. There is no God, there is no uh, king in this universe, no one is in control. Live today, you might die tomorrow, or celebrate today because you might uh, just eat and drink. Uh, everything that happens to you happens to be, there's no reason for anything. And this is the Amalekite methods and teachings. So, therefore, if you see someone that calls himself an unbeliever or uh, atheist, whatever they want to call themselves, uh, you can suspect that he is the descendant of Amalek. And the Talmud says, if you see someone that is like that, behaving like that, saying these kind of things, you can be assured that his forefathers didn't stand on the Mount of Sinai when they received the Torah. The Talmud give us some more signs, more signs. I don't, I don't want to go right down to the road, but I gave you just a taste of it. Okay? 
Uh, my advice to you, stay away from these people. These people that don't believe in anything. Believing in something is better than anything because there's something above them. People don't believe in anything. They have no God. They have no commitment. You know, they have no fear from anything. So this is the main sign to find one. Uh, uh, for example, Hitler, they're saying, is the descendants of Amalek. You see, uh, pure hatred toward Jewish. And the most amazing story I've heard when I was a child is, I think we learned it in school, that his mother was about uh, to abort the child. He almost died. But he was saved and delivered by a Jewish doctor. Thanks to the Jewish doctor, he got Hitler. And this is the thanks to the Jewish nation. The uh, ungratefulness. Pursuing after Jewish, even three generations back. They already converted to Christianity. They digged into the church's notes and books to find out Markovich and Nalovich and all these, you know, religion, and they pursued after them and killed them. All right. So we are in part five. Do you have any more questions about that? No, okay. The fifth remembrance that we have to remember every day is the receiving of the Torah on the Mount of Sinai. You must thank Hashem for the Torah every day. We can never thank God enough for the Torah, but at least we should thank Him daily and say, thank you God for giving us the Holy Torah at Mount Sinai. And thank you for the commitment that we receive anew every day. Every day it's like a new Torah. Judaism is most complicated. You know, it's very easy to convert to almost any other religion. The very basic rules, and that's it. In Judaism, there's a lot of rules, a lot of laws you have to learn. And you have to practice, and you have to keep. Okay? But Baruch Hashem, the people of Israel were happy about it. They accepted the Torah. All those, as I said many times, who wants to be part of the Jewish people is just the lost souls that Hashem put in Guatemala, in Caribbean, in Africa, in all these places. So they have to come back on their own free will. One of the reasons I've read is because, I mean, this is a lost Jewish soul. In the life, who knows where, they, they didn't really appreciated their Jewishness. Okay? And now they have to earn it back. Okay? Um, that could be one of the reasons. Anyways, so, Baruch Hashem, the, the, the Jewish people had has uh, 40 years to learn Torah. And as I said, people saying, how long does it take to study Torah? Even if you study all your life, there's still more to learn. Yeah. There's so many cases, you know, when I've learned from my rabbinical uh, degree, a certificate. So I, one of the <clears throat> topics were Isur and Heter. To my opinion, it's more complicated than Shabbat. Isur and Heter is the laws of Shechita, is the laws of mixing, kind of food. There's so many things that, you know, can this mix with that and... and, and I'm telling you, it's, it's a lot of details to remember. And it's not, it's not, let me know, I'll I give you now an example for something. Let me give you a question of something. Right now, remember something. Listen. Tell me what you think. I'll share with you a question. It's not from what I learned, it just pops up. Uh, something I share in the shul on Shabbat. A thief came to the university visiting the offices, dormitories, stealing laptops and money. And people start to notice that things, their own belongings disappeared. And at some point, this thief thaw, uh, um, steal from a guy named Zalchanan, a guy very poor, come from a very poor house, his, his, his uh, laptop. He could barely afford buying this laptop. 
So Lechanan went to the office and says, guys, there is someone here going around and many people missing a lot of stuff. Do something about it. And the university said, what we can do? We try everything. We have security. And this guy is very smart. So Lechanan says, you know what? I have, this guy's not going to do anything. So he created a note and he copied many copies. Dear thief, you took my only uh, laptop. I come from a poor family and I can't afford buying another one. Please give it back. And he put it all over the university. You know, people went by, they sort of know. Some of them fell for him, some of them thought it's a joke, maybe, I don't know. Surprisingly, two days later, a box arrived to the university's office. The secretaries open it, they see a new laptop with a note for Elhanan so and so. Elhanan heard that. He rushed to the office. Oh my God, thank you, Hashem. Where is my laptop? The university says, oh, That's not your laptop. So, what do you mean? He gave it to me. Uh, While well, he stole from the university uh, many computers and money, a lot of uh, office equipment, laptop stays here. Who's right? Can the university keep it or Elhana gets it? These kind of questions we have to deal with, by the way. This is very complicated. Very complicated. Why, why did he not because he put the note in Well, because now you have to go into the into the so, of the university. The university is, takes responsibility for everybody's things in there. So who feels? Just raise your hand. We'll do it really quick, really quickly, and I'll move on. I'll give you the answer. Who thinks the laptop stays with the university? Nobody. Who I feels? Do. You do. Yes. Okay. Who feels that? The laptop goes to Elhanan. Everyone except. You didn't raise your hand yet. And Hannah is still thinking. Calculating the info. So the answer is the answer is as follows. It's his fault. If it up in the open. No, it was broken to, to his room. It's nice. He didn't leave it in the open. You want to change your answer? No. So the rule says in the halacha, the Jewish law says that the termination is, I'll try to translate it to English the best I can. When someone lends money from someone, he becomes his debtor. No, this is debtor, you say? Debtor. Debtor. It means he owes him money. So the guy number one, number one, gave to number two. So number one is the lender. And number two is the debtor, right? He owes him money. Mm -hmm. Same laws apply to a thief. Mm -hmm. You got something for me, nonetheless, didn't give it to you, but you become my debtor. You owe it Responsible. to me. Responsible. Okay. It's going to be different rules. Uh, if they, you get caught, how much you give back. Yeah. Okay? But you still owe me. You owe me. Now, there's two different categories. If you made an agreement that... Um, when, you, when I give something to someone, he signed his uh, land, a real estate. Why do they call it a real? Because it's real, okay? It's not an element object. It could be a land, it could be a house or a building. So, meaning that if you don't pay the money, I can collect the money from the real estate. If it turns out that uh, many people lend to guy's number, guy number two. It turns out that he owes to, let's say, five people. Now he has $10,000 to give back. Who gets it first? The whole money goes to number one, and the rest will have to wait till he earns more money to give. Okay, this is the rule about if the collateral, right? Collateral. Collateral is real estate. In terms, they go in to check the dates. First come first, you get the money back. Number them. Okay. So they see what the list, the court sees the list of this date, 
you're number one, you get the money. Okay. That's not the rule about inanimate objects like laptops, bicycle, car, this kind of stuff. The first that gets it, he earns it. That's the rule. And it doesn't matter what the debtor or the thieves think or wanted to give. So who hurled, who hold the laptop first? The university. The secretary opened, she raised it, it becomes to the university. Oh, well, because it's the word of the thief. It doesn't matter. If it doesn't matter. Who, don't, nobody cares. If he wants to give it to him directly, he would give him directly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he lifted, it's his. So the rule says, the university <laughs> lift it, hold it first, it's theirs. There's no turns. The first to get something, to grab, I grab your bicycle, it's mine. For it's example. Like when they find some, an object in the street, both of them see it. The first one the first grabs one. it is right. the one that So the first one here was the university. So you see, this kind of wisdom and learning wow. they have to do <laughs> in, in the desert every day. They have to calculate things. It, it, it sharpens your brain yeah. because the brain is a muscle. The more you train, the smarter you get. Comprende? <laughs> Poquito. You're still in shock. <laughs> He's in shock. He's in shock. Okay. So, being in Mount of Sinai is not only to remember that it's uh, and, and that the time they spend in the desert is to teach us that learning takes time and effort. And even if you don't have to practice it. Just by learning it, by studying it, gets you a reward. Well, for God, what, what's uh, important is effort. If you make effort, it counts. Not unlike any other business, effort is good, but you come, there's no results, you'll be fired. Nobody cares about your efforts after two or three months. You're not producing anything. For Hashem, effort counts all the time. And it's been calculated to the reward the more effort you get, it says, Le fum agra, the more troubles you have to go through. And, and, and struggling, the greater reward you'll get. For example, if you're studying Torah right now, and one of you, God forbid, is suffering, or he's, he's tired, or, or he's sick, and he's studying Torah, his reward is a hundred times more than anyone else. A hundred times. And if it's on Shabbat, times it one thousand. Let's say, for example, when someone has an intention to do a mitzvah. I answered that last week. We discussed that last week. What's happening if it's the opposite? It's difference between Jews and non-Jews. Okay? What's happening if the opposite? Somebody wants to do something bad. Bad. And he doesn't do it for any reason. Is it considered as a bad? It depends. But mostly not. If you're prevented... But Shari Tshuva, as I said, in Allah 5, said that if you were, uh, if this is the third, the, f the fourth time will be counted. Oh. For example, you won't, you're going to a restaurant to eat non-kosher food and it was closed. And the second time, they were out of it. And the third time, and you're going, you're physically going and you're ready and you're parking and you come with the money oh, what? And, and you took the sandwich and he failed. <laughs> the fourth time, you're not saved anymore. You'll get, even if it will be closed, you'll get a punishment as if you were there buying it and eating it. Just for the intention. Just for the intention. Okay. Angering, number six, angering God wow. in the desert, particularly with the golden calf. One way to understand these remembrances is that we must thank Hashem for His patience, especially for the fact that He did not pour out His worth Wrath. wrath, I'm sorry, upon us is anger, but rather divided the punishment for the golden calf into smaller in, smaller installments. We must also thank God for his patience with us now and say, thank you, Hashem, thank you, God, for your patience with all my sins and for all the fact that you still love me. Still Even in this generation, there is no punishment that comes upon the Jewish people that doesn't have a fracture of the, uh, the scene of the golden calf. 
If Hashem has to punish you simultaneously, correspondent, exactly, you will have, God forbid, to destroy the entire nation. Hashem accepted Moses' prayers and, and uh, begging, right? And all his pleas, pleadings, pleadings, please. And he says, Hashem, from now on till Mashiach comes, every generation I'll give you a little bit, wow. a little bit of it, a little bit of it. Till, so till today, we're still paying for the sin of the golden calf. But not even all the Jewish people participated. Only 3,000. And after the influence of the mixture of people, the Erev Rav. You're responsible. As soon as you accept that these people, they become part of you for good and for the bad. It was mostly bad. People that want to participate and take share and become part of the Jewish people, not from the right, for, for the right reasons, only because I don't know, they're rich, they're smart. There's other nations that are rich and smart. And they saw the great miracles. They said, oh, the gods of the Jews can perform that. I want to be with these nations. By the way, what's wrong about that? They saw in their own eyes that the God is greater than all the foolish full high idols they had. So what's wrong about that? Who can tell me? I can't understand. What's wrong? You know what? This is the first time I see the greatness of the Jewish God, the God of Israel. So what's wrong about that? And now I see that he's greater than my God. I want to participate. I want to come become the Jew, part of the Jewish people. What's wrong about it? Moshe didn't consult with Hashem. There's only one God. Okay. One God. But I saw his ten plagues that he gave upon my, my people, my nation. I want this God. No, what's wrong? It's very simple. So it's the intention. It's not because they... they... They want to serve Hashem is because they just want to. Okay, you're saying it right. You're saying it right, but I'm missing something. Imagine to yourself that years later, or times later, someone else will come. Maybe with something they'll be impressed more. Oh, this one is greater. It's not about the miracles. Hashem has to do miracles for all the non believers, even among the Jewish people. And four-fifths of them destroyed, didn't come out. Hashem had to awaken the people. But it's in their heart. Because through the whole year they, went, they were in, in living in Egypt, they didn't change their clothings or their languages or their names. And they kept, they were loyal to the tradition they received from Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. And they were beaten to death. They were starved to death. And they never gave up. You know, you know, a, a, a miracle is an extra. It's, it's, it's a... It's a, it's a monad that you have in a, Something a, that Hashem wants to punish the Egyptians anyways. Yeah. And, but it's not because of the miracle. Miracle is part of a monad. You know, people have to see. That's why it says, And they believed in Hashem and Moshe's servant. After they saw. It's very hard to convince someone only with words that are based on a monad. It's hard. If you see... It's easier, but some part of our belief is, is, is emuna only. I can't show you God. I can't show you. Nobody can show you God. But if you open your eyes, you can see God in your body. And the way that your eyes is... is, is uh, How you question things. It's, it's just the way you question You look at your own flesh and blood and you, you can see God. The wisdom of the creation in your own body. You know that someone is superior. It's out there. Okay. But they believe only... Oh, on miracles. They lived on miracles. Magic tricks, black magic. This is how they live on. Someone else will come later on. Believe in that. What do you think Jesus did? Same. He knew a very powerful combination of words. And he could walk on water. He can fly. The Talmud says that he commanded angels to lift him above ground. So the people around him saw it. Said, this, is, this, is, uh, this is not human. They believed in him. This is why it's bad. Okay? Because eyes has to be with, the vision has to be with sechel, with mind and heart. All, the whole, the, this triangle has to be together. Not be impressed only from magic tricks. Someone else will come, will do a greater magic trick, you will follow him.
It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not a solid emuna. The foundation is very um, weak. Right. The, uh, when Moshe and Aaron started doing the things that Hashem told them to do, Pharaoh and his, his uh, magicians, they emulated some of these things, right? So these people actually at the beginning didn't believe. It was until the things that they could not do. Right. So it tells you right there that they're willing to change their, their, <coughs> their belief, Based on their trust. Seen. So, that's not good. Yeah, that's not good. I mean, been... This is why it's forbidden by the halacha to participate in a magic show. Because people led to believe that this guy is powerful, and yet this is just a magic trick it's and a trick. In, a, in, a, in very quick hands. Yeah, they're tricks. People saw Nobody someone really show me uh, uh, stuff from not Copperfield. There's another guy, Angel, Angel, Christian Angel, Angel, Angel Christian Angel, something like that. Yeah. That he is from going from building to building or they're climbing a building. It's all tricks. wires and. Yeah. And he, you know what, to his benefit, he says, yeah. it's all a show. Right. It's amazing. It's very nice to see, maybe. But people led to believe that this guy has some powerful... Only uh, people that, uh, I don't know, because after they study it, the other people come and, and show how it's done. Then people stop doing this, uh, right. that it was spirits, and they're all tricks. Yeah, but, but that's why the body say... If someone show you okay. miracles and wonders, don't let me live and keep God testing you. Okay, okay, just okay. It's true. But our belief is is based on a tradition and emuna, and we don't get impressed with magic tricks. Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. if someone will come, that's what Armand Bam says in the Book of Kings. Mm -hmm. if, if someone will come and perform magic tricks, you don't follow him. So what about the Mashiach? What about the prophet? How would be able to recognize a real prophet? Everybody is a real prophet. They have to perform something to show us that he is a real prophet or the Mashiach. So we have to, uh, you have to check him out. Yeah. For example, if he's not a well-known Navi, yeah. Isaiah, Jeremiah, we don't live in that generation. They were well-known, they were tested. Yeah. Someone will come and say, for example, you see this cup on Wednesday, 2 o'clock, I see here, this is the line, water from rain will fill up exactly by 2.05 and 17 seconds. You, you look at the clock, you look 17 seconds, boom, it's filled to the line. Oh, good. good. Mm -hmm. If it was 15 seconds, he is a false prophet okay. and he should be put to death. He's a subject to death penalty. He missed two seconds. So the Allah says, you, the, the rabbis, the great rabbis checking him in different ways. Uh, one or two or three times, after that you don't question him anymore. The only time you question him or you don't listen to him, if he asks you, asks you to um, transgress a law from the Torah. Yeah. This the week law, yes. we don't keep Shabbat oh, after oh. performing all these miracles. <laughs> or today you exempt from I don't know, putting tefillin, for example. Or it raises immediately a red flag. Yeah. Or it's Pesach. Or Pesach, so forth and so on. Okay. So let's conclude this uh, part of angering God. The main point uh, of this remembrance is to recall how much we angered God with our unnecessary crying and complaints from the very beginning of the redemption from Egypt. As the Torah testifies from Deuteronomy 9-7, remember, do not forget how you angered Hashem your God in the desert from the day that you left the land of Egypt, until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against God. So we rebel, but it's bad. Hashem said, don't forget. <laughs> Why should I? You should remember they were rebellious. They put you in your place. Always remember that you messed up. As King David says, he says, my sin is in front of my eyes is my red flag, is my warning sign. I always remember that I can mess up. I can sin. Don't think that you're perfect because you're not. And if it's not in front of you, if you don't take all precautions, you're definitely going to mess up. You're going to, you're going to sin. This is why it's part of the 10 remembrances 
that you have to remember your forefathers they were greater than you it said the king greater than you higher level they messed up if someone feel like that and live by it to remember that you remember his failures and errors and you're always ready to correct and you remember where what, what and and how and when he did wrong he will surely stay on the right path and will be afraid and he will not stray away from the path that Hashem paved us in his Torah. Any questions? We continue 7, 8, 9, and 10 with Hashem next week. On behalf of Ohev Israel Foundation, I want to thank the Medina's family and all the participants. God bless you with all the barachot in the Torah. Amen. And God give you an abundance of parnasah and a fresh elema to Andy Rojas and all those who want to mention their names. Uh, I want to thank all those who are helping and supporting Ohev Israel to spread more words of Torah and helping families in Israel. Let's go to our website, Ohev Israel Foundation. God bless you for all your support. Shalom, shalom. Amen.